So ladies and gentlemen, we're a bit under time pressure because um, the, we have to we started uh, we, st we have to start a bit late, um, but still have to finish in time. So I am encouraging all of us to have a very focused and tight session. Um, I would uh, really like to briefly, very briefly, um, introduce um, the speakers to you, and then. Um, right away give, it, give the floor to the speakers. So we have, um, we have four speakers um, on, the, on the panel uh, and actually they, are, they know each other, they are working on a, on a joint project so the whole, uh, the composition of the panel reflects uh, a, a general, a more broader project on Visegrad Germany regional uh, cooperation and um, uh, Vladimir Bilchik will, will say a few words ab about this. So I start with Vladimir Bilchik, senior researcher, European Studies Program at the uh, Slovak Foreign, Minis uh, Foreign, uh, Foreign Policy Association, I'm sorry, in Bratislava. Uh, Vladimir Handel, who is a research fellow at the Institute of International Relations uh, in Prague, a real veteran, I can say. I think you started there in 1983 already, so you've seen quite a lot of developments. Uh, Andros uh, Hedje, uh, junior lecturer at the National University of Public Service in Budapest. And uh, last but not least, Konrad uh, Pawlowski, senior fellow at the Department of, for Germany at Northern Europe uh, Center for Eastern Studies uh, in, in Warsaw. Um, I just want to really introduce into the topic of regional cooperation real quick because I was reading on my train ride here to to Prague, I was re uh, reading uh, an, anal an, an analysis of uh, Andrea Gavrich and Maxim Stepanov uh, of the uh, uh, German Council on Foreign Relations, and they just published in September of this year a study uh, from the German perspective. So that, that the analysis or the title of the paper is German Foreign Policy Towards the Visegrad Countries, Patterns of Integration in Central, uh, in Central Europe. And I just want to quote one one sentence from their conclusions, because it might also trigger an interesting debate here. They come to the conclusion uh, that uh, Germany, or I quote, our conclusion is that because of unequal interests and differences of opinions, uh, the V4 as a whole is less important to Germany uh, than the sum of its individual bilateral relationships. Uh, I, I leave it there, but of course it's interesting to see what the perspective looks, looks like the other way around, uh, how the V4 countries uh, see um, their, um, their cooperation with Germany. Um, I think we have a very good composition of the uh, panel um, because uh, it will reflect, uh, as I said, a broader project. Um, um, as I said, Vladimir uh, Bil Bilchik uh, will uh, introduce the project, so I won't do that. Um, but I just say as much that in the larger framework of that project, of that, um, of that endeavor, um, he will cover governmental and institutional issues. Um, Konrad, is, uh, uh, his expertise is very much in economic affairs, so we, he will very, very much focus on economic aspects of regional cooperation. I think Andras' focus, uh, if I learned it correctly, is on foreign and security policy. Um, there's another uh, collaborator who isn't here who is also focusing on defense issues. And I think then, uh, as a veteran, uh, Vladimir, who's not directly participating in the project, will wrap up uh, finally and give his own thoughts on, on the topic of Germany, Visegrad Regional Cooperation, its future potentials and limitations. So I will leave it there by way of introduction and uh, hand the floor directly to, to Vladimir. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, and uh, good evening almost to uh, everyone. And thanks for actually uh, staying uh, along in uh, such high numbers. Uh, I do realize this is uh, the last panel which is keeping uh, most of us uh, uh, away from dinner. So um, I hope uh, at least that will be a good enticement to, to stick around. But I also hope we can have a, a kind of good brainstorming and a good debate on this. Uh, I did like the quote, Marco, that you raised from the Tega Ape paper. Uh, it's a very nice and polite way of saying that perhaps uh, to Germany these relations uh, 
are not important uh, in any way you look at it, uh, either collectively or uh, individually. Uh, uh, and, and I think that's one of the challenges, uh, mildly put, the problems which we have to face and confront in terms of how to uh, engage or re-engage Germany in, in Central Europe and uh, what's the role of uh, uh, the Visegrad group in that. Um, let me say a few things, uh, a few sentences about the project itself. This is really a project in the making and actually uh, most of us are meeting here in Prague for the first time to kind of discuss what we have virtually exchanged via email. But uh, the project is conducted under uh, the um, uh, Think Visegrad initiative, uh, which is uh, a consortium of think tanks from the uh, for Visegrad countries um, coordinated by the Slovak Foreign Policy Association and uh, the um, outcome of the project should be something we call the long-term analysis uh, which will uh, serve uh, particularly the um, interests and the readership in the uh, MFAs um, in the four Visegrad countries. So our task is to look at uh, the state of uh, V4 German cooperation but also ponder the future and uh, of course, that's uh, always a bit tricky, particularly if you come from the field of social science to talk about the future in any credible way. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll try. Let me uh, um, um, put together some of my thoughts. Uh, I'm going to be addressing mostly the um, issues of uh, governance and um, uh, and uh, institutions. And by the way, uh, the whole project is uh, framed by the EU context. So we're talking about particularly uh, or specifically uh, the V4 German cooperation inside the European Union uh, uh, mainly. Um, which is, which is the main context. Um, let me start with some introductory remarks on uh, just the overall uh, context of uh, uh, potential and limits of uh, German V4 cooperation. And let me then move on to uh, some opportunities stemming uh, from um, the uh, current setting uh, in the EU institutional and bigger governance framework. And then let me talk about some risks uh, for cooperation uh, in um, on, on governance and, and institutional issues and now let me come up with uh, some recommendations so let me try to kind of organize my remarks around these four points um, on uh, overall cooperation uh, of course uh, um, um, if we even start thinking about cooperation between the Visegrad countries and Germany uh, we have to talk about some in incentives um, and, and in terms of incentives uh, you could look at uh, operational issues um, how much of an added value would the V4 be uh, as opposed to individual um, V4 relations with Germany but also you have to look at interests uh, share interests in terms of uh, what the V4 actually uh, are interested in what they want inside uh, the European Union, how uh, that could be played with uh, Germany. Um, now, in terms of the operational potential, um, uh, there, uh, I think there is, there is a, a, a potentially great scope for the Visegrad group because if you look at the bilateral agendas between Germany and the individual Visegrad countries, uh, really as, uh, um, as we look at the last decade or so, um, these agendas are not problematic from German point. Uh, maybe with the exception of Hungary at the moment, but really you don't have uh, serious bilateral problems. So in terms of bilateral issues, um, uh, the, the German interest um, in um, picking up um, uh, the, the relations individually uh, is, is not particularly strong. Um, and Central Europe as a whole, um, it seems at the moment is, is not low, but relatively low on the list of German foreign policy priorities. I mean, let's be honest, uh, there are much bigger issues inside the EU. Uh, we're still dealing with uh, uh, aspects of crisis management. We have uh, the external crisis, external crises, if we uh, um, extend it not just to the east, but the southeast. We have uh, things like Ebola, uh, TTIP on the table, uh, which uh, concern and consume Germany and German foreign policy um, in many respects a lot more intensively than relations with uh, uh, Central Europe. Um, so in that sense, um, 
uh, the uh, Visegrad 4 plus Germany format could, uh, in fact, be uh, a uh, prominent, uh, potentially prominent uh, format for uh, discussing um, a number of issues inside the European Union, a number of issues of common interest. That is, if we can actually identify it, that interest, and that gets us beyond the operational issues and, and uh, gets us um, to discussing what, what the interests are and what the basis for cooperation could be uh, to achieve that potential of, of added value V4 plus Germany. Um, now, of course, uh, when you look at trade, investment, when you look at the region uh, and um, issues of uh, common financial tools in the EU, um, you, you find a number of uh, uh, joint interests and, and, of course, you find a lot of uh, interdependence between uh, the V4 and Germany. Uh, yet, uh, at the same time, uh, there are clearly uh, strong limitations um, in terms of uh, how much uh, we can talk about V4 interests. Um, Yes, we are interdependent, but can we actually formulate something uh, which uh, binds that interdependence and, and gives it um, a real sense in terms of uh, V4 plus Germany as a format for consultations, for policy initiatives, for um, essentially uh, doing things together uh, if, if you want. And of course, the initiative has to come from us, um, uh, not, not necessarily from Germany, because we have to be the ones um, pushing Germany uh, and and trying to have Germany on board uh, for our own agenda. Uh, and when you look at the V4 uh, uh, picture, and uh, today has been rather gloomy uh, already. We've had a couple of panels touching on V4 collectively, but also aspects of V4. And, and really what I'm taking away from this is um, as if in terms of interests and in terms of the ability to not just identify them, but to do things together, uh, we are um, uh, in many ways at the beginning, at the start. and, and uh, Beyond talking, we haven't gotten very far uh, on a lot of agendas. Um, so, um, uh, um, and uh, apart from that, what we heard today, defense issues, uh, this, this relates, and, and Russia um, and the external crisis, of course, this relates to other policy fields which we could discuss, like energy, for instance. Um, we also have uh, somewhat uh, different uh, positions inside the European Union. Uh, that aspect of variable ge geometry affected Slovakia is in the Eurozone. Uh, the other three countries are not. Um, um, Hungary is, is somewhat problematic uh, inside the V4 grouping for a number of reasons, which uh, have to do largely with Hungary itself. Uh, that again uh, poses additional uh, set of problems uh, to um, um, trying to uh, have a common basis in the V4. And of course, uh, you still have the um, things like the role of history, uh, particularly uh, German history in uh, the various V4 countries, especially Czech Republic and Poland, which can play a role in domestic politics. So you have internal limitations here. Uh, which are um, tied to the specific countries, but also to their positions uh, in the European Union. So uh, uh, that's kind of the big picture. Let me move on to uh, a bit more of a focus on governance and institutions. Um, and let me talk about uh, opportunities, uh, which we might think about picking up uh, today in terms of uh, addressing some larger governance and institutional issues in inside the European Union. Uh, in terms of opportunities, um, I see at least uh, two sets of opportunities. One is contextual. Um, um, and uh, it seems to me that at the moment, uh, inside the European Union, uh, we have a much more favorable context uh, to actually attempt to have uh, not just a regional grouping, but to uh, have a dialogue in a format V4 Plus on, on a number of uh, uh, political and policy related issues. The crisis management mode in, in the EU is uh, largely or partly over. We can discuss to what extent, but the acute crisis is, is not here in the acute crisis of Eurozone. We do have, uh, we are facing additional external crises. Uh, but this, of course, uh, sets a much wider policy agenda in front of us. 
uh, a few years back, uh, the policy agenda was reduced to saving the euro and the eurozone. Uh, and of course, that limited the potential for, for dialogue. Today, uh, the scope is much greater. Uh, and, and we have a whole set of priorities outlined by the new commission and uh, also the European Council in June. Uh, but of course, we also know what needs to be done. Growth, fiscal stability. Uh, we need to deal with the neighborhood uh, or the neighborhoods. Um, and we have the wider global issues uh, related to things like uh, TTIP, for instance, which I had already mentioned. Um, the second set of opportunities relates to institutional um, uh, issues um, and the fact that the EU is being relaunched or launched anew. And this, of course, creates a favorable context uh, for um, uh, the Visegrad group and for Visegrad Plus formats. Um, uh, we have uh, achieved a sense, at least for now, of uh, new legitimacy and ownership of new EU institutions. Uh, we have a new European Commission uh, with which most member states are happy, uh, including Germany, which was terribly unhappy with the last Commission for different reasons. Germany seems to like the more political Commission, like the process, the way Juncker was, was chosen. Uh, most V4 countries uh, also identify themselves with the process. Against Hungary um, uh, was a bit of a uh, different story in this. Uh, but essentially, um, uh, the, the sense of strong legitimacy and, and ownership is, is something uh, which uh, uh, creates a favorable context. We also have uh, um, a new leadership in the European Council which happens to come from the region, from Poland. And we have a greater coherence um, in the institutional structure. Um, uh, potentially also something which might bring together uh, the region and Germany on a number of issues, uh, because um, the new president of the European Council is not going to only head the summits of the European Council, but also the Euro summits, if they ever happen again. Um, right now in the post-crisis mode we seem to like the Euro summits, but nonetheless this is something which again uh, creates a sense of uh, 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 much weaker divisions inside the European uh, Union. Um, we also have uh, EU presidencies um, uh, which uh, uh, are coming up and um, which um, uh, could uh, bring potential to V4 and um, uh, German cooperation, particularly the Slovak presidency in the latter half of 2016. So uh, those are the institutional opportunities uh, when we talk about uh, the um, chances to grab in terms of uh, trying to uh, launch a more strategic and more permanent uh, regular dialogue between V4 and Germany. However, there are risks here uh, in terms of uh, how we move ahead in this relatively favorable setting for now. Uh, one risk uh, which is really kind of structural inside the European Union and ongoing but quite pertinent right now when we discuss these bigger policy challenges is the big tension between the political realities and the legal necessities. Namely, uh, most people would acknowledge at some point and fairly soon we might need a treaty change in the European Union. Politically, however, this is unrealistic. Even Germany acknowledges this. So we have to tackle policy challenges under the existing uh, uh, rules. Uh, the question is, uh, can we do this? Um, and. Um, um, how, how, how far can we stretch the existing rules in terms of our ability to tackle the, the policy challenges? Um, uh, we also have um, an overall challenge inside the European Union in terms of how uh, much we can sustain um, the lowest common denominator uh, under the existing treaties. So there is that push, we need to change treaties because we need more integration. On the other hand, there is that push, we need to change treaties because some of us might want to get out, especially the United Kingdom. So again, the UK is a huge risk in terms of uh, keeping the institutional and governance coherence of the EU together and uh, this could have strong reper repercussions for relations also between the V4 uh, and Germany. Uh, the UK referendum if and when it happens uh, um, could um, again uh, create all sorts of issues. But here again, there is potential for coalition uh, building, uh, particularly on free movement of persons, which has been an issue uh, raised by 
uh, by uh, the UK uh, and uh, where Germany and the V4 have a strong united position. So the question is how do we keep uh, the existing acquis together and how do we keep it working practically? Uh, on the one hand, that's that's kind of the tension from the uh, um, from the side of the UK and those who want to um, see the single market working, uh, but nothing beyond that, or not much beyond that. And at the same time, we have these new policy challenges and, and how, how to grapple with those. Uh, and I think that in itself poses an important set of issues for V4 German uh, strategic dialogue. Okay, I do have some uh, uh, recommendations uh, in terms of how to move ahead on uh, governance and institutional uh, agenda. Um, and what could work well in terms of establishing also an attractive basis in the V4 vis-a-vis uh, -vis Germany. Um, let me just mention three things. One is uh, the V4 works well if there is a clear leadership, clear common voice, and that depends largely on V4 presidency. Uh, Slovakia is holding the V4 presidency right now. I'll give you one example where actually the V4 has been able to have a strong voice inside the EU and that was the whole uh, climate uh, package which was adopted by the uh, European Council a couple weeks ago uh, and this was largely thanks to the management of the presidency and the dialogue on these issues from early on. Um, um, otherwise, we're not going to be able to do it. So the V for presidency is something which I think needs to become a lot more important if we are to have a uh, established base for regular uh, and strategic dialogue between V4 and Germany, and if we are to have a clear single voice on uh, policy issues. Um, now, um, the second, second set of issues uh, relates to uh, communication. Uh, and, and how we communicate uh, particular issues um, inside the European Union, especially. Um, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, V4 countries, uh, I think what's, what's important uh, is um, to look beyond uh, the themes and the topics which have defined uh, our priorities inside the European Union thus far. Um, and uh, they have been largely tied to issues of uh, financial gains uh, and uh, um, uh, things that we do not want inside the European Union. I think what's important is to draw some positive red lines, if I can put it in this way, uh, in terms of the key policy challenges ahead of us, uh, unemployment, uh, growth, uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal capacity and, and fiscal stability. Um, essentially, um, the uh, communication by the V4, uh, both individually and collectively, is, is uh, something which uh, uh, presents a big challenge, not just in common sense, but in terms of the way how we discuss and pitch uh, EU policy making in the individual uh, member states. Um, so that's more of an internal political challenge. Um, and um, um, Finally, uh, I think what's really important uh, in terms of being attractive uh, for Germany as, as V4 as a group is the ability to perform and deliver results. So far, the V4 has been associated in the European Union largely as the group of countries uh, with the uh, EU North. Uh, but I think this is being questioned, uh, not just because of Hungary, for instance, uh, but also questions are being raised about fiscal capacity in, in other member states, including my own Slovakia. Uh, I think we also have a big issue uh, domestically coming up in a number of countries, perhaps with the exception of Poland, and that is uh, our inability to actually uh, um, draw the gains of European integration, particularly with respect to European funds. Uh, we're going to be hit hard next year, uh, and basically the image of um, decent performance in the EU and, and reliable partners could be seriously undermined and struck by our inability to actually draw on the financial games from the European uh, integration. This, is, this also relates to communication, that performance issue, uh, but it's something which, uh, which uh, uh, we do need to work on if uh, the V4 uh, as a group is to become attractive. So, as I say, these are some initial thoughts uh, on um, really what is a huge agenda uh, and we'll just sit down and uh, start writing the paper in the next few weeks. So, any comments are welcome. Thanks.
very much, um, Vladimir, and I hand directly over to, to Andras. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Andras Hetje. I'm from the National University of Public Service. Uh, which means that I am not a government, uh, not working for the government, so I'm quite free to speak my mind. Um, I'm, I will talk about external EU, um, more specifically external issues um, where we four countries and Germany can cooperate. So I'm going to talk about uh, mostly Ukraine Eastern Partnership, um, TTIP, and um, um, yeah, these will be my, my, my three most important points. I leave energy, defense, etc. Uh, aside, and I'm going to concentrate on these points. Um, another general remark, um, there has been a lot of talk about Hungary not playing the game of the V4, um, doing um, things which undermine V4 in the last couple of months. As we are trying to look forward and to the future with this paper, I will try to leave this behind and the assessment of these things which of course happened, some were, um, in my opinion as well, mistakes on the part of the Hungarian government, some were a bit unjustified or, or uh, unjustly exaggerated by the press. Anyway, I'll try to skip these in order to look forward. Uh, maybe I could elaborate that on that on um, when we are coming to the questions. Um, and I will also present my paper um, in a way which will um, give to you many questions. So I don't really came with answers. I have many questions because we are just now trying to, to write this paper. So I have many open questions. Um, my central thesis is that if we had met one year ago, I would have been much more skeptical about the cooperation between V4 and Germany. Because I think right now there is a window of, of opportunity for a stronger cooperation between Germany and the V4 countries. That's my main point. I think there might be a stronger German receptiveness towards V4 positions, a stronger receptiveness than in the past. Why is that? Who made this possible? I think it's quite clear one person, Vladimir Putin. So I think this is a quite good time to try to grasp this opportunity and the V4 states have a better selling point towards Germany and they have, uh, um, I think, a stronger receptiveness, a stronger attention from Germany because of the th situation in the Ukraine. So that's my general remark. I will talk about four points. My first will be TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with the USA. Here, the situation is quite clear. Both we four and Germany support um, the signing of this important treaty with the US. We should bear in mind um, that all the five countries are trading nations. Not just Germany, but also all the V4 countries are trading nations. Uh, when we look at the ex exports of goods and services in relation to the GDP, the Czech Republic is at 79%, Hungary at 94 Poland at 48 Slovakia at 89 Germany at 51%. So let's make this clear. Let's try to focus on common ground between we four countries and Germany in every possible arena where there is talk about trade. Not only TTIP because it's um, already on track, but why not, my recommendation, why not talk about further trade deals between the European Union and certain emerging countries, be it in Latin, Latin America, Near East, Far East, etc. So I, I would wish a stronger acknowledgement of the fact that both or all the five countries are trading nations and very much interested in lowering of, of the trade barriers. The only um, point which is still in a limbo regarding TTIP is the ESDS, this um, Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, which, interestingly enough, on about this topic, there is no consensus in Germany as far as I can see. Um, the CDU and the German Chamber of uh, Chambers of Industry and Commerce support it, the inclusion of these dispute settlements, um, while the SPD are against it. And there seems to be a similar disagreement among the V4 countries in this respect as well. For example, Hungary very much opposes the inclusion of this ESDS or ESDS um, into the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnerships. So, Regardless of what the position of the V4 countries um, is, 
there is somebody to talk to in Germany. If you are against it, it's a, it's a SPD. If you are for it, it's a CDU. So I'm not an expert, of course, on, on, on trade and investment deals. Let, let's be honest. My point is that I want to acknowledge that either way, the V4 countries, if they find a common position, might influence um, German attitudes toward this topic. One last sentence about TTIP. Hungary is, is especially interested in, in um, gas export from the United States. This is what our um, Foreign Minister Siarto said. That's something which is very much interesting, I think, not only for Hungary, but also for other V4 states. My second point is about the Eastern Partnership. Um, there has been a signing of association agreements with Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova in June, which was very much supported both by Germany and the V4 states. So once again, a common ground to start from. My, hang or my recommendations, which are part of the recommendations of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and um, Foreign Minister Siarto, are the following in this regard. Total visa liberal, um, liberalization should be pursued vis-a-vis -vis these three countries. And the second, um, Eastern Partnership programs sh should be tailor-made for each country. Right or up until now, there was rather uh, uh, an, uh, an approach which was one size fits all. The Hungarian position is, is let's tailor-made each uh, program, part program for every country. Um, another recommendation enhancing the V4 Eastern Partnership Program. There is a special fund, special mechanism for that V4 Eastern Partnership Program. Let's try to enhance it. I'm speaking about money, of course, uh, mostly financially, this program. And overall, let's try to achieve um, bigger sums, more significant sums for overall Eastern Partnership Programs. Um, this is also something which these five countries could work on. Once again, I see here what I told you at the beginning, a window of opportunity. As, I, as far as I can see, the Eastern Partnership is given its due weight in Germany, a much stronger interest in Eastern Partnership than a couple of years before. Um, Chancellor Merkel said in November last year, Eastern Partnership has great potential. In April 2014, um, Steinmeier and Fabius, French Foreign Minister, were together in Moldova and Georgia. So it's I think uh, uh, there is a bigger interest coming from Berlin towards these countries than used to be. And only last week, Chancellor Merkel, after the Brisbane G20 meeting, said um, that it's not the conflict in Ukraine is not only about Ukraine, but it's also about Moldova and Georgia, so as well as Serbia, for example. So I think the Germans are looking much more. Um, openly and much more attentively towards Eastern Partnership countries, something which Poland, I think, especially, but also Hungary, can welcome. My third point, Ukraine. Um, there has been a divergence of V4 positions in the past. Once again, let me skip this part and look what we can do in the future. I think we have lots of common interests here as well, Germany and the V4 countries. Um, we in general support the new Ukrainian leadership. Ukraine should be firmly on the European path. And if we talk about Russia, a consensus about the implementation of the sanctions against Russia. Um, there has been a lot of talk about Hungary not supporting the sanctions. The facts are that we have implemented them, implemented them and we are just as the other 27 countries uh, are going to implement them as well. So. Um, just to, just to make this clear. Um, one opportunity for V4 countries here is, I think, um, something which became clear from the um, um, statement Mrs. Merkel said after Brisbane, um, where she, I'm sure you read it, where she very strongly um, said or, or criticized Russia and said Russia was violating the territorial integrity of neighboring states. Um, Russia is questioning the, um, the, the peace order in, uh, in Eastern Europe or in Europe in general. And 25 years after, after the fall of the Berlin War, she does not want, want to go back to a situation where this can happen again. So 
I think um, these are thoughts we, um, which are very much in line with the V4 positions. How can we support, back to Ukraine, how can we support, um, strengthen the new Rukinian leadership? I kind of think we could begin with small things. One Hungarian proposal is uh, partly in implemented as well to open new visa centers across Ukraine to facilitate the movement of Ukrainians to the European Union. We will open in a couple of weeks a new visa center in Kharkiv. We have already opened one in Dnipropetrovsk uh, and Kiev, and we are planning to do the same in Odessa and Donetsk. This is something small, seems rather ins insignificant. I think this could have a really beneficial um, effect on Ukraine. My last point is my, third, my uh, fourth point is the enlargement of the European Union in the Balkans. Here, once again, it applies what I said at the beginning. Putin has thankfully knocked heads together, I think, in between Germany and the we four countries. Um, in the last couple of years, Germany was in the skeptical camp um, when it came to further um, enlargement of the European Union in the Balkans. It's, this was not really acknowledged widely, but um, you could quite um, easily detect it. Uh, for example, in many SVP papers, um, there was these, these um, uh, informations or statements. This has, I think, also quite radically changed. Um, one example being Angela Merkel has met eight um, Balkan state, head of states in August and said that significant progress has been made in the Balkans and the future of the Balkan countries are very much in the European Union. So. This is exactly what especially Hungary is pushing, but also the other four, other three countries um, try to work on that. And um, bear in mind that Germany is coming out of the skeptical camp and has a more open attitude. Two last thoughts. One, what about Turkey? Do we four countries support the uh, Turkey's EU's EU accession? while uh, uh, Germany is sticking to the um, privilegiated partnership, or the privileged partnership, whatever that may be. Uh, maybe are, they, are there possible um, common ground between we four countries and Germany in this regard? How could Turkey be moved closer to um, the European Union? And my last question is what about a common V4 and Germany position on UK membership? Do we want the UK in? The European Union. Under what circumstances do we want UK to stay? How far are we, go are we ready to go? Um, and also, if we're talking about UK, Vladimir was just touching upon this. What about UK, um, um, the, the, the steps the United Kingdom has taken towards trying to limit the freedom of movement in the European Union? Something is, which is very much against the uh, interests, I think, not only of Germany, but especially of the V4 countries. Um, so I think also vis-a-vis the -vis, um, UK, there is some possibility to, to, to work more to get, uh, stronger together, and there are several opportunities, I think, there. My very last point, um, for a long time, Germany was reluctant to engage very strongly with the V4 countries because it did not want to um, antagonize France and nurture suspicions there about um, uh, a dominant Germany in the Central Eastern Europe. Uh, with, Fra with the French-German relations somehow in, in dire straits in the last couple of months, um, maybe there's a chance, I don't say, to, to substitute France for Germany with the V4 countries, of course not, but maybe uh, another possible route of advancement towards the uh, hearts and minds of Germans um, look, we are four countries which are inside the Maastricht guidelines, while France has just announced that it won't be under 3% in 2015 as agreed, but only in 2017. This is another selling point, the fiscal um, um, strength of the V4 countries. So that would have been, uh, or that was my, my short presentation. I have many questions, some answers. I'm really looking forward to you commenting on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andras. And then I hand directly over to uh, to Conrad to cover the economic damage. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I like very much uh, the words Marco uh, has quoted at the beginning of our uh, discussion. 
and I will try to challenge them with some economic arguments and s show some areas where, where we can cooperate with Germany and s show some limitations for such uh, cooperation. Uh, so I, pre I prepared some small presentation to make my, make my speech more uh, structured. So first of, of all, I would like to describe some background for uh, economic cooperation, so show some uh, changes in thinking of Germany and in position of Germany and of V4 countries. Then I, would, I will uh, try to elaborate on some economic challenges and later on also energy challenges. And at the end I will try to give some ideas what can uh, the common position be. So let's start from the first point. So, first of all, uh, we should uh, notice that there were several important changes in the environment, economic environment of uh, Germany and V4 countries. So, first of all, we are at the end, there are some geopolitical geopolit aspects which are important for both, uh, for the whole re reg region. So, we are right now at the end of uh, the era of uh, enlargements. So actually that makes Germany less interested in V4. Uh, Central Europe and V4 uh, sho ha ha have shown during the crisis that it's not problematic region as for example Southern Europe, uh, what makes also uh, meetings less frequent. But on the other hand, there are also several uh, factors that gave some chances because of it. So, uh, first of all, uh, there is uh, V4 uh, countries, uh, they proved during the crisis that the whole region is uh, quite strong economically. And there, of course, there were some uh, temporar temporary problems, uh, for example, in Hungary and Romania. But most countries uh, have shown that they, are, that they managed crisis really, really well. Uh, as in case uh, of Latvia or uh, other countries. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, from geopolitical uh, context, we should also uh, take a notice that we have also problem with Ukraine and Russia, which is also should bring uh, attention of Germany closer to Central Europe, as uh, this is of crucial importance for this reg region. The second thing is uh, political consequences of the Eurozone crisis, which are quite important. So for sure, they strengthened the position of Germany. Germany is uh, perceived uh, as much stronger a country as one of, as actually almost a leader of the, an uh, informal leader of the uh, Eurozone and, and the EU as a whole. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Germany uh, became more alone than in the past. Uh, there is not, not, not there is the, the relations with France are quite tense uh, for some time. We don't speak anymore about Mercosy uh, duel. Uh, that the, the camp of traditional uh, supporters of German policies, such uh, such as uh, the Netherlands or Finland, is also weaker. As Finland, for example, has problems uh, after fall of Nokia and. Uh, uh, problems on the Russian market, the Netherlands uh, started to be more eurosceptical than in the past. Uh, and on the other hand, hand, there is V4, which, is, which seems to be a quite strong region, a region which is um, somehow a product of Washington consensus reforms. And there is some similar, similarity of our perception of economic policy in V4 countries and Germany. Uh, and the other thing is evolving role of energy security, which also should uh, get our positions uh, more closer. Uh, because uh, energy security got stronger attention, either uh, uh, in, 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 in capitals of the EU and in the EU institutions. So uh, it is no... Uh, it is, not, it is not no wonder right now that uh, we are uh, negotiating cli uh, climate agreements, taking care about industry more. And the fourth factor which I found uh, important, I think it's uh, the, it's the, 
I think that the relationship of V4 countries became more mature. Of course, we see right now some temporary problems, but when we looked, uh, when we looked at uh, specific uh, economic matters, we could make some good agreements in the recent years. The example of it can be, for example, EU budget negotiations for the multi-annual financial framework 2014-2020, uh, where uh, V4 uh, quite successfully built uh, a group of friends of cohesion, even if, even if it wasn't very easy, for example, for Czech Republic to be in both groups of uh, austerity and uh, uh, countries and friends of uh, uh, cohesion. Uh, the second thing, the, another example of good cooperation is climate negotiations for the 2030 uh, framework. Uh, also, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Donald Tusk to become uh, EU Council uh, President is also a success of region. So it shows that we, are, we somehow learned how to deal in the EU. And if we are determined, if, if we identify our interests correctly, we can make an uh, interesting and efficient uh, group of pressure. Let's, come, let's move on to economic challenges. Uh, so I would like to give several examples uh, and show where our perspectives uh, and Germany are uh, rather distant and wh where they are quite close. So first, first of all, one of the most important things, so Eurozone crisis. As I said before, so Germany is a strong leader right now in the Eurozone, but it's a lone reader, uh, leader. The, the Germany uh, succeeded to uh, introduce uh, austerity measures in, in the EU and in the Eurozone to make some reforms uh, in direction to make countries uh, more strict on budget rules. But on the other hand, uh, there is louder and louder criticism of uh, German positions from many countries. Uh, Germany is often criticized for uh, too large export surpluses. So actually, it's the country which needs allies in the EU. Uh, on the other hand, there is Central Europe, the V4 countries, which uh, sh have shown that they managed crisis quite well. They are rather countries uh, of more liberal solutions, uh, and they can be also an, uh, a precious ally, uh, especially if Great Britain uh, will decide, uh, decides to leave the EU, which is also perceived in uh, Berlin as a risk. So I think there, there, that there is uh, quite there is here quite interesting area which wasn't uh, it, which wasn't used before. So uh, maybe V4 countries should be louder and, uh, and uh, should voice louder their ideas for reforms of the eurozone and should uh, take care more about uh, strategic uh, choices uh, in the eurozone and and uh, in the EU. Uh, we should, uh, of course, uh, get to know that uh, the fact that uh, only Slovakia is a member of the Eurozone, but on the other hand, no of the other V4 countries have opt-out clause. So we have to, uh, Poland, Hungary and Czech Republic have to enter the Eurozone. But also, the, from this Eurozone situation, there are also some limitations. Uh, if the things went wrong, uh, there can be uh, problems in our relations, uh, in relations between V4 and Germany. So, for, first of all, this interest of Germany in the uh, southern countries and Eurozone. If issues get uh, worse, and worse uh, there, can, there, there, there can be a problem because Germany can be uh, forced to accept some measures, some reforms of the Eurozone, which are, which are divisive, divisive for uh, the whole EU. Example of it can be the Eurozone budget. For now, this is out of the table of negotiations table, but it can be brought if the situation gets worse. 
Uh, and there is also, as I said before, this uh, division, uh, uh, the whole V4 is not, uh, there is not complete cohesion on the topic because Slovakia is in the Eurozone. Sometimes the aims of Slovakia and other V4 countries can be uh, diverse. And another example, banking union, which is quite specific and it's uh, a case for the nearest even months. Okay. So, uh, so as I said, V4 countries have to, uh, uh, the three uh, V4 countries, apart from Slovakia, have to enter the Eurozone. So, so they should be taken into account in the debate about uh, banking union. Uh, German, it's also, I think, interest of Germany because Germany is very interested in stability of the, uh, of, of the Central Europe. Uh, we, we don't have to mention that uh, if, we, we, if we take into account all, all the V4 countries, it's one of the most important economically region for Germany uh, in the world. Uh, and participation uh, in the banking union, it can be an advantage uh, either for Germany and for V4 countries because for Germany, there can be another ally which can support uh, often uh, German ideas. And on the other hand, uh, for uh, Hungary, Czech Republic and Poland, it can be also a proof that the Eurozone system is, being in banking union, can be a proof that Eurozone system is not so unsafe as we sometimes think. And the, this architecture doesn't bring new uh, risks for the financial stability. If not, uh, there can be some limits uh, which can be unpleasant either for the Eurozone or for V4 countries. So uh, banking systems on, in, in uh, V4 countries are quite dependent on uh, the investors from uh, West, West, Western countries, from Eurozone countries. So if there will be a separation of Hungary, Czech Republic of, or Poland from these talks about banking union, in the future, there can be some uh, conflicts in management of the crisis, for example, between uh, European Central Bank and national regulators, uh, which can be damaging for both sides. So I have just uh, and also energy challenges, but I'll try to make it very short, not uh, because the time is almost uh, passed, mm, have almost passed. So uh, I think that the energy is the question which is, uh, which is uh, much more uh, a joint question for Germany and Central Europe. We have actually right now uh, several uh, common challenges. Yeah? First of all, is, uh, it is security of energy supplies. I think, this thing, uh, the significance of these things have grown in the whole Europe. The second thing is uh, actually question if Russia is a reliable partner and supplier of resources. We have to ask this thing. Uh, for example, the events from the uh, from uh, from October shown that Russia doesn't have to be a reliable partner. In in uh, October, Gazprom suddenly uh, delivered much less gas than uh, it was in the contract. Uh, and Central Europe is also important as a transit region and as a region important for the security of supplies in the EU. EU. So there is a broad need for cooperation in this area. But there are also some limits. So for sure Germany is much more uh, diversified countries and it's relatively safe compared, as compared to Central Europe. And we have different perception of risk. Some German officials say that actually uh, Russia is a very real, reliable partner and it's never uh, used uh, gas and uh, energy uh, resources as a, a political weapon against Germany. Mm. So I, I, I will skip just climate policy, which I, I found also important. So just to conclude. So, uh, in, the, in the area of uh, economic things concerning the Eurozone crisis, uh, there is one conclusion. 
uh, although there are several things and processes that sh that that are showing that actually it should be uh, it should it should be it should be a, an impulse which is actually uh, make the the cooperation with Germany uh, m more di uh, more difficult because there are some diverging interests but on the other hand there are some potentials if uh, V4 uh, will be more louder on uh, Eurozone issues and will take part more in the debate and uh, in energy issues I think that there are there is quite uh, there is much more uh, ch there are much more chances for a common position and we, ac we actually share a lot of uh, common interests with Germany so thank you very much Thank you, Conrad. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. And then Vladimir has the final word on the panel. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Marco. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not part of the project. I just listened now to the presentations, and uh, I really am, am not able to analyze uh, the findings of the colleagues. But I will comment briefly on some of the issues. One of the comments, obvious comments, which also actually were addressed uh, uh, in some of these uh, uh, presentations is that Germany never was keen to develop uh, the relations with Visegrad countries for many reasons. One of them, Andras, I think, mentioned uh, being afraid of France uh, and because France, of course, expected Germany to, to develop a clientelist relationship in Central Europe and manipulate and uh, these countries and uh, uh, and that's what France was really very, very cautious uh, and looking at Germany, what it was doing. But at the same time, there was the second point uh, uh, with, which also uh, was addressed in, in some of these uh, uh, presentations, the coalition building. For Germany, the coalition building uh, within the European institutions is all, all obviously key now with the EU 27. Uh, this is the way how G Germany will have to uh, operate and Germany always has been very, very, very cautious to support any kind of group, group building which would hamper the free coalition building on issue based uh, agenda. So um, I really, I'm really rather skeptical uh, uh, or at least cautious there. So where I did, where we did see Germany working with the group was during the transition period, during the uh, transformation of, of the whole, whole uh, area of or region of Central East Europe. Germany was key to to this. Uh, um, uh, integration of these countries into the European Union, into NATO. Uh, the ma major uh, uh, issue was, of course, this uh, 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 westernization of Central and Eastern Europe, making Central and Eastern Europe uh, homogeneous, homogeneous with the uh, Western Europe in terms of institutions, norms, uh, procedures, uh, to some, some extent also policy making. This was, this was a great ex success, a German success, but uh, since that time what we see rather is, is uh, kind of German sort of uh, feeling of, of um, uh, this enlargement and transition of Central East Europe being mission accomplished and Germany really st lo <laughs> start, uh, uh, dropped uh, its or decreased its interest and moved its interest a little further to the east and to, to, to other areas. So uh, uh, it, it is going to be a very difficult, I think, task for, for the Central East European countries, for Visegrad, to, to generate more German interest into the region. And I, I, I see that all the colleagues really are doing a great job in looking at the issues and areas where this could, where this could happen. My, um, my uh, second point is that I, I'm afraid that these, I'm not sure that the Visegrad countries are really uh, able to generate uh, sustained uh, policy lines uh, uh, both in, in, in Europe and vis-à-vis and -vis Germany. I'm, I will rather refer to my country, uh, the Czech Republic, but um, we, we have a difficulty. We have a great asymmetry with, uh, in relations with Germany. I'm not, I don't speak about the uh, asymmetry of potentials, uh, power potential, economic, etc. I'm rather speaking about the asymmetry in the way how foreign, foreign, foreign policy uh, making is being conducted in these countries. In Germany, you have this uh, difficulty um, uh, of uh, coordination of this uh, institutional plural pluralism of German foreign policy making. And this is, this is really a challenge for German foreign policy and it has been discussed and, and, and etc. What we have in, on the side of the Visegrad countries, 
is however, however uh, uh, in, uh, a pluralism of policy make, of policies. We have, a, we have really a, a very limited national consensus on foreign policy issues. And what we, what we tend to have is that uh, we have uh, different com governments or changing governments, changing also foreign, foreign policy lines. If you look at German debate now on, on, on Hungary or, or, or on, on future Polish uh, elections and the prospect of, uh, uh, of, hopefully not, but the prospect of, of Kaczynski's uh, return to the German uh, to foreign poli uh, 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 Polish policy making this is this is a uh, uh, video on what the Germans say and uh, if you look at the Czech Republic the, 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 there was a such a w warm welcome for the new Czech, Czech government uh, after these uh, elections last year and again now you look at Germany and German uh, German sort of understanding of Czech, <coughs> Czech, Czech, Czech uh, uh, political mass here uh, in uh, uh, in relations with Ukraine and Russia as, as a great great disappointment and uh, so I'm I'm a bit skeptical that we are really able to generate uh, a clear and sustained policy line, and uh, therefore I say this is this is the key actually the key task uh, where these countries have to really uh, focus uh, their, their their efforts. Then uh, um, I skip some other uh, issues because we have don't have much time, but then just brief comments on on the German interest to keep uh, the uh, Visegrad countries or the region uh, going. Yes, obviously, there is, still is the key German interest in, 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 in keeping this area uh, st stable and homogeneous and, and compatible with, with Western Europe. That's a key, key interest, obviously. Then the second interest is that uh, was also mentioned uh, that these countries tend to, to belong to the so-called Nordic group in, uh, within the European Union. Vladovicic mentioned it and Andras and uh, Konrad as well. So yes, this is again uh, uh, some kind of political the capital we have here. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm also, I also agree that uh, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, is a great integrator of, of, uh, of Europe and, uh, and again pushing us uh, together and pushing us closer to, uh, to, to Germany and to the core of Europe, European Union. Again, it is uh, the task for these countries to, to, to sort, sort out their policies, and again, I refer to, rather to Czech Republic, uh, where we have um, we don't have a, a, a institutional uh, a institutional pluralism. We have an institutional mess in Czech foreign policy, with with the president uh, traditionally uh, and consistently doing uh, d different things than the government does. Um, Balkans. I'm not so sure that uh, there was the Berlin conference was it was a change in, in German behavior. I think I and uh, I tried to make some sort of uh, uh, fat fight emission on this. It was rather a flanking political sort of uh, context. Uh, but 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 you were right. I think uh, the Visegrad group, if there is a if there is an issue, it is, it, it's Ukraine and, and Moldova and Russia, and it is of course the Western Balkans, the Balkans or back Balkans. So you are right. I think that there is a, there is a chance to to work uh, uh, and to push or to work together together with Germany. And last but not least, uh, the France. France is a, is a is a terrible nightmare for Germany because France, Germany is losing. In France uh, within the European context. I don't think Visegrad, and it was not suggested that Visegrad could replace France, but uh, perhaps uh, 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 this uh, multi dimensional, multi attitude, uh, uh, multi sort of, uh, uh, yeah, multi. No. Uh, uh, s several uh, more azimuth, uh, azimuths of German foreign, foreign policy making may be one of the outcomes of this very difficult sort of relationship with France. Uh, 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 my, my, my worry is that with, without France uh, really going through these necessary reforms, uh, uh, Germany and European Union will have a terrible prob problem and, uh, and we will all uh, pay for this. So, yes, thank you for the uh, 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 possibly the opportunity to talk, uh, to briefly discuss uh, the presentations, but I'm, I'm looking forward to reading what you uh, what you uh, finally will publish or, or, or send us, and I'm, I'm sure it will be a very encouraging and insp in, uh, inspiring paper. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So that, that we have, <clears throat> that we still have a little bit of time to discuss. Um, I mean, I just want to spend one or two phrases to try to bring all these presentations together and maybe have the, but really quickly, uh, maybe have a, um, the basis for the, for the discussion the uh, last 15 minutes. Um, obviously, I think this is a very promising project um, and I like very much that you 
focus on specific interests, on specific policies that are, that are operationalizing or that, that you can operationalize and that you in, in, in that way look beyond, you know, general statements of how good multilateralism is and that we share histor historical, uh, historical common history and historical legacy um, and, and really look into the hard interest things. I think this is re very promising. And I think a, a common red thread of all the presentations was, at, at least with the exception of Vladimir maybe, um, of the project is that, that there are good signs that the uh, environment, the European environment has become more conducive. Uh, more, more, more productive or more conducive to Germany before regional cooperation. So you mentioned a lot uh, of the factors. Uh, the EU is less uh, focused on the economic crisis. It can, can be forward-looking now. Um, there's Putin, there's France, the UK. So you mentioned all of these factors. And then I, I guess you came up with very concrete ideas about the uh, interest issue. So you, you summarized where interests collide and where they coincide. And I think, uh, I, I mean, I just took the note, uh, TTIP uh, trade seems to be an area where there's promising area, uh, where there's promises for cooperation, Eastern partnership, possibly austerity policy in the future, austerity policy. Then there are other areas which are not so clear whether they have a, a lot of potential for regional cooperation. On, on enlargement, I'm not so entirely sure if uh, really Germany has changed its, its lukewarm support for enlargement into the Western Balkans, but we can discuss that. And then in the last panel, I guess it was clear, uh, even though it was not specifically addressed here, that defense cooperation is maybe an area where we can expect least uh, scope for cooperation, but I, I leave it to the discussion. So just to summarize, it really seems that we have to look into specific issue areas uh, to, to judge what the potential for regional cooperation is and where the limitations are, um, and that there's a lot of need for flexibility involved in this regard. So I leave it there, and uh, we have maybe 15, 20, uh, 15 minutes for the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take your, your questions. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Fawn from St. Andrews in the UK. Uh, a very informative panel. Uh, could I make one observation and ask a couple of questions, please? F the observation is something very basic, but we shouldn't overlook it. The amount of energy and interest that's going into Visegrad. I mean, really, that's quite striking in itself. I think there was a word I didn't hear in the presentation, and I would like to perhaps know why and some of the implications from it. I understand that the project, of course, is framed in terms of Germany and V4 cooperation potentials. But V4 is famously applauded for the plus, plus format. Uh, and at various levels and with various arrangements of countries, Visegrad has met. Um, and that, that, as I say, has been greatly applauded. I'm slightly wondering why we're not thinking about that format here or anymore, and also what the implications are of those plus formats for other Visegrad partners, if Germany is given this uh, almost totalizing attention. We touched on the implications in terms of France, but I'm thinking about other arrangements. I mean, Germany, you made a very compelling case as to why Germany is front and center. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I'm just wondering about, uh, as you put it yourselves, I think the context of, of this uh, and, and the successes that Visegrad has had with the plus format with many other partners. Thank you.
Uh, I may share some of the skepticism of Vladimir Handel, but I'm also impressed by the work that has been done and that we have watched here. Uh, and uh, I think that there are many, many things that are very encouraging that I heard and that we all heard. One thing, however, comes to my mind when Vladimir speaks about the lack of communication or troubles in communication. It's not only communication between politicians and, let's say, the elite and so, uh, or people responsible about very important decisions, uh, decision makers. You know. I thought of communication in general in the whole region. And as a teacher of languages, I thought and I observed in Czech Republic, and not only in Czech Republic, Slovakia, I think as well, and maybe it's the same in Hungary and in Poland, a drop of interest in learning German. And I was wondering whether you, from the side of the V4, or whether from the side of Germany, there should not be more, we know, lingua franca is English, but I think it would be for Central Europe uh, of, of great importance if German, because in, old, in many of those countries it was the second language, you know, if German was somehow kept alive and either through Goethe Institute or whatever sort of channels, you know, it would, uh, because I know that the Deutsche Arbeitstellen, etc., they just uh, disintegrate even at my university in Olmitz, that was a very, very important institution and there are not enough students interested in studying that. So, with the, some encouragement, you know, of German as a language for that region might not be of interest and worth sort of pursuing. One thing, and then the other thing is, I was just wondering, speaking about Middle Europa, Central Europe and so, uh, if this relationship between V4 and Germany is being observed by another German-speaking country, that means Austria. Do you perceive any, in a way of sort of receiving it, or how do they see that from Vienna? Yes, thank you. Istvan Bolg from the Hungarian MFA um, for uh, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to react to um, Vladimir Bilchik's um, presentation in particular, um, a very interesting one at that. Um, you mentioned Hungary several times in a, sort of a negative context. And on Hungary in the V4 in particular, you sort of portrayed Hungary as the only factor that explains why the V4 are, you know, taking a different approach in certain issues. Uh, we know we have been taking an, an alternative approach on some issues. Um, but this is not the only factor why the, the V4 have uh, become divided, obviously. Now, the V4 could have become divided even without Hungary taking an alternative approach and pursuing its, uh, its national interest. Um, um, and on German-Hungarian relations in the V4 plus Germany context, well, our bilateral relations uh, are as intensive as ever. Um, we had our foreign minister over in Berlin last week. Um, our Prime Minister uh, regularly visits uh, different parts of Germany and, of course, Berlin included. Germany is, is our largest trading partner. Um, so I just kind of felt that your assessment needed some, you know, maybe some refinement or adjustment to sort of reflect the full spectrum of uh, realities. Thank you. Uh, comment. I, I think you, you're right that Germany will never give up uh, cooperation with any partner which it sees as important. That's why Germany will never give up on Russia, Germany will never give up on Hungary, Germany will never give up on anybody, uh, because this is the cooperative way of German policy making. Germany is an inclusive actor. Uh, what we were indicating here was the way how Germany 
uh, relates to uh, to individual partners uh, in this case also uh, Hungary uh, uh, more privately so to say or inside in, within the uh, uh, German foreign policy and expert community and uh, that was the comment on this and uh, I'm sure if you well Perhaps it's not the topic for this discussion, but uh, I can assure you that these uh, comments, which were um, uh, very, very decent comments uh, <laughs> on this panel, were very relevant, and I think they reflect uh, fully the way how Germany perceives the uh, developments in, in Hungary. Um, my second comment is on, on uh, to Professor Jasap. Yes, uh, Germany. Germany is really not uh, not the key interest of Czech, of Czech, Polish, uh, Hungarian, and Slovak students. And uh, unfortunately, the governments really don't do the, don't do their job. Uh, uh, if we look at the importance of German of of qualification of or, or German knowledge uh, uh, of the Czech uh, or Slovak uh, um, uh, working force. Uh, labor force this is such a such an important potential for for uh, there are uh, increasing mar uh, chances on the labor market this government this Czech government really never did anything on, about about uh, uh, I mean uh, pushing the interest and uh, 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 of, of Czech uh, pupils or, or Czech uh, uh, pe Czech people, labor uh, uh, force uh, uh, to uh, to study Germany. So it is up to German embassy. It's up to the uh, Austrian embassy, by the way, the, uh, and uh, Goethe Institute uh, to to develop uh, their programs. But the Ministry of of, of Education, is so far uh, as far as I know, it is uh, it just only I just only agreed on this German Austrian uh, in initiative. Uh, uh, but didn't contribute anything. So yes, I think this this is this is one of the e examples of the losing uh, of these countries, uh, losing the potential which is there, uh, being not realistic and being not really uh, strategic in their thinking. And uh, I fully agree with you. Yeah, thank you. So I just very short because there were not. Uh, not many questions addressed to me. Uh, just uh, some notice about. So I don't. I don't feel that German is uh, popularity of German language is decreasing in Poland. In, in Poland, I think it's increasing. Actually, I think. I think that's much much worse with French, which which was actually almost on equal grounds with the German in the past and right now. But it's just my subjective. I, my, maybe I should look at the data. And uh, just maybe one comment to Vladimir, so to maybe try to revive his scepticism. So I, I, I just I just think that maybe G Germany doesn't support groupings, but we also don't uh, don't talk about the V4 to be uh, common on every topics of the EU. But on the other hand, on the very specific topics, if we build up some some group of countries support is supporting some uh, policy as for example friends of cohesion i think germany will be quite interested to cooperate and uh, because you know it, it's efficient w way of making some diplomacy and and and, and uh, if they have to they will meet us if, if, it, if it's efficient and if we carefully identify topics which are really uh, common for us and not just play it late uh, before some summits. Okay, thank you very much. Just short, some short comments. Um, v4 plus format. I just recently understood that or, or heard that um, our uh, president Adar Janos was in uh, Bulgaria and Sofia, and the, ch and the Bulgarian president asked him about the possibilities of joining um, to the V4 grouping. So maybe next time there will be five experts sitting here. Uh, also, somebody from Bulgaria. I don't know if this is a good idea, but anyway, there is clearly an interest in uh, uh, among maybe Romania as well, also Bulgaria, especially to join this format. About German language use uh, in in um, in Hungary, I can say I studied my, my made my master and my PhD at the Andras University, which is the only German-speaking university outside of the three German-speaking countries. Um, and it's, by the way, uh, um, it was founded during the first Orban government, so just to uh, 
um, maybe present them in a more positive light. Um, back in 2000, 2001 was this university um, founded. And yeah, your point on free movement, double standards um, in the V4 countries, that's a very good point. Um, we very much like a free movement when it favors us. Um, we are not that much op really open towards free movement of labor when it means that they are coming to us. So, um, a point, interesting point, thanks. Thank you. A uh, few issues. Um, one is on this uh, V4, V4 Plus, uh, Rick asked about. Um, I think maybe the biggest fan of V4 Plus format is the Inter International Visegrad Fund, because every time they meet up in the V4 Plus format, they seem to get more money into the fund. You know, you have this V4 Plus meetings with uh, Koreans, Japanese, and, uh, and it always uh, comes down to more money for the Visegrad Fund and the Visegrad countries uh, and the projects we do here. Uh, so I think it is a very attractive uh, format in, 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 in a number of settings and I think it's well and alive um, uh, and in very practical terms. Um, um, and it's also very present in politics. I mean, obviously, we have this V4 Plus. Uh, others who may have been uh, or are interested in joining um, the grouping, uh, becoming closer. I don't think uh, the enlargement of the Visegrad group is on the agenda, will be on the agenda. Uh, I should say anytime soon, but I think it's off the agenda. Um, uh, but it's it's something which, which works well with countries uh, which uh, are on this side of the EU, uh, was very useful in the accession process and, and also among the EU, the, the, new, the uh, new member states um, and V4 plus uh, the Baltic states, uh, V4 plus Benelux country, so it works also well in the regional setting. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure why we haven't used it. Maybe it was just, you know, we didn't use it, but I think it's, it's well in the line. Of course, V4 plus Ukraine works very well. We just had the V4 plus Ukraine meeting of, of presidents um, this weekend um, in, uh, in Slovakia. Um, uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's something, however, you would market vis-a-vis -vis Germany, of course, uh, because I don't think that would, uh, particularly for practical and political reasons, uh, be uh, necessarily a, a, a good, good marketing point. So I think it works well vis-a-vis -vis outsiders and the countries in the region and perhaps other comparable regional groupings, uh, but you probably don't want to use it so much vis-a-vis uh, -vis the big countries. Um, um, now, in terms of um, Austria, uh, that's an interesting point on Austria you're raising. I think Austria is, um, um, again, one of those plus countries for the Visegrad, uh, and uh, it's an increasingly important country in the region, uh, partly for Slovakia, because it's the only Eurozone neighbor of Slovakia. Uh, and that's created kind of new dynamics also in bilateral issues. It's also interesting these days when uh, this foreign ministry actually is kind of pushing the uh, Austrian line and, and sort of this uh, southern line, Slovenia, etc. Uh, things that especially Petr Rulak has kind of been presenting as, as, as something which is perhaps a, a new uh, tangent or priority of, of uh, Czech foreign policy. So in terms of the Slovak-Czech dimension and, and the Slovak dimension, that's, that's something which is very important. I think if you look at the larger scheme of things, include Poland and the whole V4 group, uh, you, you get a different sense of dimension. Uh, but, but again, I think Austria is very important uh, for the region, uh, also because of trade, because of investment, it shares a lot with Germany, but also because of inf infrastructure. I mean, we haven't mentioned infrastructure here in terms of practical issues, and that's something perhaps we need to also think about when we talk about uh, Germany um, and, and the wider region, and, um, and, and Austria, of course, is and should be a part of it. Um, and... Um, uh, only one sentence on Hungary. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that the issue is, is being talked about because I've been in so many meetings uh, recently on Central Europe and Visegrad countries where we, you know, kind of say, you know, this is really an issue we should address in terms of uh, the region, but let's not talk about it. But I don't think it's an issue which we are going to discuss here. It's for the debate here. So uh, that's where I'll, I'll leave it. Thanks. Okay, so thanks to the panelists, thanks to the audience, and good luck with your project. And now let's conclude the conference. Thanks.